familiar with blue and the charmed ones too. Charm chats. Hello. Hello. And welcome to Charm Chats with Kendra and Kat. We so, are now on episode 315, Just, just harried. harried. Yeah. This one aired on February 22nd, 2001. And I would just like to preface this with saying, while the last episode had many, many tangents, this many. episode will not have nearly as many. Like, I'll mention things, but I'll mostly just be giving links to the website. Um, because even I need a break from tangents sometimes. And it is... Perish the fucking thought. I know, right? But it is just so hot. Yeah. That, like, my brain decided you can either go on these tangents or I will melt. Like. <laughs> and since you're clearly still in solid form, and I don't I, think you I got hit to... by the Statue of Liberty mutant maker. No. It seems you chose to not go on tangents. Yeah. So. I decided against the melty brain mm -hmm. with the tangent making. Okay. And and so, yeah. I mean, it's it's not like there won't be any, because we get some new people, I think. At least we get people. Yeah. <laughs> so I get to tell you about them, and, and there are a few things that I will be mentioning. But yeah, for the most part, it'll be the, here's this thing that they're mentioning. Okay, go check the website. Yeah. <laughs> because... Reasons. Because of reasons. Yep. Because of sanity reasons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because summer is hot in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So hot. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's yep. my feelings on the subject. Mm-hmm. And the worst part is, like, you know, I, like, in winter I always joke about why do I live where the air hurts? Yeah. It's the same thing in summer. Why do I live where the air hurts? <laughs> it's not that the air hurts necessarily for me. It's that it is attempting to suck the life out of me. Yeah. Because, like, like, the the air is objectively attacking me during winter. Yeah. But I'm covered so much that it, it doesn't get much except my face. Yep. But in summer, it's just like you've been stuck in between two plastic bags and you can't breathe. Yeah, it's like... I, I and believe, there's just pressure. I believe I equated it to trying to breathe through soup. Yeah. It is just... It is so... Like, the air is thick. It makes me glad I don't live in the South. Yeah. Especially the Southeast. Yeah. Because there is no respite yeah, no. anywhere in the no. southeast from all the humidity. I feel really bad right now for my, my friend John. His wife is pregnant. Oh, no. And she's, I think she's due in August. Oh, and so, the yeah. worst month. Yeah, so, like, she has to deal with it. And I, like, I'm a July baby, all right? Like, yeah. I, I was born in July, and I hate summer. Mm. I was born in September, and, well, I wasn't supposed to be born in September. <laughs> I was supposed to be in October. Well, but, oh, well. Uh... But yeah, that means the entire summer mm -hmm. was very difficult for my mother. Yeah. Like, I, I, as much as I dislike winter, I have always come at it with the caveat of you can always put on more clothes than you can take off. Yep. And so I like winter better than summer. I just wish that Pride Month wasn't during a month that I wanted to peel off my skin. Because yeah. Because then I would actually go downtown to the parade. I looked up the last time I went to a parade was in, in the 90s? 2010. Okay. So before that, it was 98. Okay. And that's the one where I gave myself pneumonia walking in the parade. Oh, wow. But yeah, so I've only been to Pride Parade in Chicago twice. And that was the last time I went in, in 2010. Uh, it was so hot and muggy because it had rained that morning. Mm. And it was like, I literally was like, why, why are you raining on my parade? Literally. But like, literally, the rain stopped like maybe 20 minutes before the parade started. Yeah, it was a... And it was just hot and muggy and, ugh. And then it became sunny and hot and muggy and mm -hmm. it was just not, it was no. not pleasant and I did not enjoy it. And I'm like, you know, as much as I love 
pride and and like being around all these people and 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 enjoying the energy that is all of these people i just know i'm done done so and and even worse i had to take a train to get uh, there and we all know how i feel about trains yeah nothing. so it was not fun for me I wound up calling somebody and having them pick me up because I was like, I'm not even taking the train home. Like, I will I will walk. I don't like to walk. And I'm like, I will walk, like, five blocks that way so, so you don't have to try and drive through the parade route so that you can come pick my ass up because I don't, I'm not doing the train thing again. It's not mm. happening. Yeah, no. No, the last March <sighs> parade thing I was at was at the Science March last year. Yeah. Because it wasn't too warm. I got to wear a jacket. I had my sun hat, which, spoiler alert, is a literal sun. <laughs> well, well, it's a literal depiction of a sun. It's a say, solar it's, system. It's a figurative sun. It's a solar system where my head is the sun. Yep. I'm very proud of my sun hat. Um, it's nice. It's it is. very geeky and very you, uh -huh. and I enjoy it immensely. Yes. Anyway, so, back on to the episode. Yes. Yeah, anyways, later. <laughs> Five hours later. Um... Thank you, SpongeBob. I can't. I, like, anytime someone goes, eh, 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 somebody, you know, whatever, five minutes later, every time I get a SpongeBob card. Thank you, Tom card. Kenny. Yep, I get a SpongeBob card in my brain. Yep. So, this episode, uh, according to Holly Marie Combs' Twitter from back in, I want to say it was January, um, a, this episode sparked a couple of tweets where she basically said that she, as well as a few other uh, ladies on the show, were, were writers on the show. Um, intermittently, intermittently and without credit. Yeah. And and this this was sparked because of the whole reboot drama craziness thing. Um, I will link to a couple of, of the tweets um, that she put up on the website. Though I know that one of the tweets that she was replying to originally or quote tweeting originally it no longer exists and i don't remember what it said i didn't like take pictures of them or anything yeah someone but probably it was screenshotted it. yeah maybe um but it was it was something to do with the reboot insanity. there's probably a buzzfeed article yeah. or something no I, I doubt that but but yeah so there there was a bit of drama upon this episode um back back a few months yeah but we're past that drama now and we're back not going when it to was cold yes and we are we are not going to to harp on it because if you are a patreon person you know our thoughts on the reboot mm -hmm. uh because that's where that yeah we've already hashed that out episode is yeah yeah okay so let us start the episode shall we we shall. We shall. We start with a shot of a wedding cake with a cake topper of a man and a woman. Very generic man and woman. Yep. And we pan up to see Prue and Phoebe in what is the dining room, sans table, mm -hmm. putting a floral arch in place for the wedding. Yep. Phoebe is in orange pants and a short sleeve, off the shoulder, blue cropped shirt. It has some, like, crisscross stitching on the shoulders and the bottom hem, and her hair is in low pigtails, and she's wearing some green dangly earrings. Mm -hmm. Prue is in gray pants and a long sleeve sheer shirt with a green flower pattern on it, and it's a low v-neck that's tied with a string at the top, and we see a green lacy bra underneath, and her hair is down. It was actually not too bad of an outfit. Like, I could have totally seen me wearing that back in the day. Mm -hmm. And off to the side, we see Graham's spirit directing them about where exactly to place the flower arch. Yes, she is in a long sleeve red outfit with matching red nail polish and red and gold earrings. She really loves to coordinate. She even really, dead. really does. I always find it funny that the spirits will, like, change their outfits. Mm -hmm. Like, whatever the fuck they want. Yeah. I Graham's mean, is not? just super fashionable. Yeah. Graham's also changes her hair. Really, that's more Jennifer Rhodes changing her hair, but... Yeah. So, as a reminder, you can check episode 115 to find out all the info on Jennifer Rhodes, who plays Grams. Grams asks if this is the biggest arch they could get, and Prue jokes that it's the biggest one they could get without opening a fast food franchise. 
which is a joke about McDonald's. Mm -hmm. This kind of makes Graham smile a little bit. Yeah. So I will give a small tangent because there are some very interesting things on McDonald's. It is a fast food company that was founded in 1940, but it didn't actually use the Golden Arches for the first time until 1953 in a location in Phoenix, Arizona. And their original headquarters were in Oak Brook, Illinois, but they are now in Chicago proper. And the first kosher McDonald's was established in 1997 in a mall in Buenos Aires, Argentina. That's that is, interesting. Yeah, that is not where I would have thought the first kosher McDonald's would have been. I guess Argentina has a large Jewish population? Uh, apparently. Uh, yeah. Search me. Uh, yeah. I, it, that one blew my mind, and I was like, huh. I've, I've been to the original McDonald's mm-hmm. possibly a couple of times. I've seen the original things they used to make the French fries. Mm-hmm. The cutters. I think yep. I operated one of those. Um and I've been to the corporate McDonald's in Oak Brook. Yep. Oh damn, that was fancy. Yeah. yeah. I don't and think I've it's seen there and I've and I've walked a dog past the um <laughs> the 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 small shop one in in Displains. Is it Displains? I don't yeah. remember. Um my sorry, my brain is mush a little today. Um but it is basically it's it's a facade of what the original McDonald's looked like. Right. And every once in a while, they will open up the parking lot for, like, a classic car show. Oh, that's cool. Where people can come in with their their um, 1950s, 1940s cars and, and just, like, show off their cars in the parking lot of this old yeah. McDonald's. The founder's name, Ray Kroc. Yep. Which is just a real fun name. Mm-hmm. And I believe it started out... It's no Rip Torn, but it's a good name. So true. Um, yeah, I, I believe it started out not as a hamburger joint. No. Like it, it started out um, very differently. But I will link to the wiki on the website, uh, of course, so that anybody can check it out for themselves. Because it is... It, I, I love... I love that this, this podcast has, has given me the opportunity to just go onto Wikipedia and look up random crap and learn some new shit that is just so interesting. Like, who would have thought a kosher McDonald's, the first kosher McDonald's, would be in Argentina? I just would not have thought of that. I didn't know there were any kosher McDonald's. I knew there were kosher McDonald's because I know a friend uh, who went to one in Israel. Okay. So, like, Israel, at least, it made sense to me. Well, that makes sense. Like, They'll want as much as possible to be kosher. Yeah, like that at least made sense. But Argentina, that just blew my mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway. anyway. Graham says that love is a quest, marriage is a conquest, and this place must be like victory. It's such a weird phrase, but it's so Graham's. It's so Graham's. It's like that, that just slightly cryptic, but it a, works. A little, um... Haughty. Yeah. Uh, Phoebe says she thought weddings were supposed to be romantic, but Prue tells her that she should listen to Grams because you could always calculate her age by the number of rings on her fingers. Which gets, like, it, it, it makes Phoebe laugh and it, it makes Grams, like, waggle a little finger at her, like, uh-uh, yeah. you know. It was so cute. I'm going to see if I can find a gift set to, to, re, to re-block uh-huh. that on Tumblr because it's just, it's funny. Prue marks off the wedding arch from her to-do list, starts to say what's next, and yawns. Yeah. And, of course, Kat must yawn now. Yeah, I yawned so many times while making these notes, and it didn't help the fact that it was hot, nope. and I was already tired. Mm. And today, now now talking about it, it doesn't help that it is warm, and I am tired. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Phoebe says that Prue has been yawning all day so she should go upstairs and sleep. Prue says that she's been yawning all week because she's been having a reoccurring dream that's keeping her awake. Phoebe asks about the dream and Prue starts to mention a cute and dangerous biker guy and then Piper comes down the stairs and looks around. She's in jeans and a red cami top that has a small line detail under the bust with black bra straps showing and her hair is down and she's got that little diamond necklace on. And we can see that there are flowers on the banister, and the wedding cake is on the table um, 
in like in the foyer, and it is three tiers tall. Mm-hmm. It's a very classic looking cake. Yeah, it's not it's not too big. Yeah, I presume. That, well, no, and it's I those. Guess the top tier would not be the whole red velvet thing. I guess some people do that. No idea. Or maybe it's a sudden thing. I don't know. I don't know. I might have gotten this from TLC as a child. Could be. But it's one of those three tier cakes where where the tiers are not connected yeah. to each other. They are connected via little pillars. Mm-hmm. Which are presumably standing on little dowels that have been shoved through the, through the cake. Yep. And, and there is the possibility that each tier is on like its own little plexiglass or like... Cardboard, I think. Cardboard or plastic or something. Yeah. Little, little that's round. That's what it looks like. So that it's held up um, on those little... Little, uh... That's usually the columns. MO. Yeah. Um, anyway, Grams asks Piper what she thinks, and Piper says it's all beautiful, and Phoebe's just happy that it's happening. Piper sighs, and they all realize that what they really want is their mom to be there. Piper asks Grams, but she says that she's only there because they need a high priestess, and she needs to be back by the witching hour the next day. Now, the witching hour is a folklore thing that denotes a time of night most associated with supernatural events. And in Western Christian tradition, it's between 3 and 4 a.m. due to the absence of prayers during the canonical hours. But more recently, it's between midnight and 3 a.m. So we are assuming grams means midnight. Yeah. So, yeah. Links on the website, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Phoebe holds up a photo of Patty saying she thought it could help. Piper seems to be on the verge of tears and Prue asks if she's okay. And she says she just can't believe how close she came to sabotaging her own wedding because she told herself that if one more thing went wrong, it just wasn't meant to be. Yeah. Don't do that, people. No. It's, it's, it's thinking, thinking. Yeah. Grams tells her that she doesn't need to think that way because she's made it. And Prue says that she'll personally kick the butt of any demon who tries to ruin it for her. Mm -hmm. And then she yawns very largely. Mm -hmm. And Phoebe... Um, takes Prue upstairs to go tuck her into bed. Yeah. Graham says that she'll see Piper at 4 p.m. the next day and calls her Mrs. Halliwell and reminding her that the women in this family keep their names. <laughs> she then disappears with a wink, Piper smiles, and then looks around the room. And we fade dissolve over to Prue's room where Prue is asleep in bed. And we cut to Prue's dream. There's a bar, there are people playing pool... And the camera pans over to another pool table where Prue is playing pool with a couple of biker dudes. I'm not going to tangent on pool, but I will link to all Q-based sports on the website because there's some fascinating stuff in there. I just love that there's one called Snooker. Mm-hmm. It's just a fun name. It is. Anyway, Prue is wearing jeans with a large belt that has a bunch of square, like, panels on it or whatever. Mm -hmm. A blue denim button-down shirt... With, with very few buttons closed, exposing a purple bra. Mm -hmm. She's also wearing a necklace that I think we've seen before. It was yeah. like a little small turquoise pendant, and then there was a blue feather. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. She's apparently playing eight ball, because she clears the table by sinking the eight ball, and then says to a biker in a blue shirt that he owes her 20 bucks. He says he never agreed to a bet, and then a guy in a white t-shirt and leather jacket approaches them. He looks like an extra from Greece. He really does. He really, really does. He looks like he stepped out of one of Phoebe's old movies. Yeah. Like, because he's got, like, the slick back hair and, like, the jeans and, and white t-shirt and the leather jacket. Like, yeah. he looked like a knockoff Danny Zuko. Like, oh, no, he really no, did. no, a knockoff Kanicki. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Knockoff Kanicki. Oh, man. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, he, he tells the guy who doesn't want to pay that the rules of the house are that the loser pays and then offers to take him outside and teach him the rules. The guy backs down and hands for 20 bucks, which she takes, thanks him, and promptly, promptly tucks the money into her bra. Yeah. And it's very visible. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just right there. It's just, it's just, just showing sticking, it off along sticking with sticking right out, right out there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't get a name for either of the guys in this scene, but I might as well tell you how, who these actors are now. The blue shirt guy is apparently a character named Ray. He is played by Douglas Bennett. He has 58 acting credits so far, starting back in 1993. He's mostly done single episodes of TV shows, including playing Philip in the Double Meat Palace episode of Buffy, uh, the Vampire Slayer, just after this episode of Charmed. And his longest gig was an eight-episode run on the show Sons of Anarchy back in 2013-14. Mm -hmm. The knockoff Danny Zuko 
Kaneki character is named TJ, which we will find out later. He is played by Dana Ashbrook. He was born in 1967 in San Diego, California, and he has 67 acting credits so far, starting all the way back in 1978. His biggest gig was playing Bobby Briggs on 30 episodes of Twin Peaks oh, back in 1990-91. That's where I know him from. He then reprised his role in the 2017 Twin Peaks reboot as Deputy Bobby Briggs. <laughs> he also had nine episodes as Rich Rinaldi on Dawson's Creek back in 2002-2003, for anyone who might recognize him from that. I did not. Yeah, I think I recognize him from Twin Peaks, because he also... Had a bit of the biker aesthetic going I on. I never watched Twin Peaks. That My birth announcement was based on Twin Peaks. Really? Yes. My dad wrote it. Wow. It was written in the style of the FBI agent's, like, tape recorder recordings. Wow. It was hilarious. Mm-hmm. That is, that is fascinating and says so much about your father. I think I have it somewhere. I'll have to have you read it. Yeah. Because it's not long. It's fascinating. But anyway, uh, Prue turns to TJ and asks if he wants something for helping her. When he says he does, she says that he'll have to win it like everyone else. And then he grabs her, saying that he might just take it. And he stands nearly a head taller than her. She says that he should leave her alone because he has no idea who he's dealing with. Which gives me flashbacks to the last episode with Sutter. Yeah. Uh, and then he says that she should show him. And, and she, she kisses, kisses him. him. Then when they break from the kiss, she says hi with a smile. He apologizes for being late. And she says that she's sorry he's late because now she has to leave. So clearly that was some role playing they were doing. Yeah. She starts to leave. He asks her to stay. And she starts to give an excuse and he says that she gives the same excuse every night, that she has responsibilities. And she says that she'd love to leave a responsible half behind, but can't. He tells her to blow off work and enjoy the freedom of making her own choices. She says she wants to know what that freedom is like, but then trails off, kisses him. And smoosh, she, you know, she like smooshes his face up yeah. in an adorable way. And then she walks off and he calls after her, asking what her name is. So apparently he doesn't even fucking know. Right. So here's the thing. I want to know if she's been been there all week. Why would you not ask for her name the first time? Or at least the second. Maybe even the third. I just, I'm confused by this. Did he think he could divine her name from tongue games or something? Yeah, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Like, clearly she hasn't been getting drinks. Because then the bartender would definitely know her name because he'd have to be carding her. Well, I mean, granted, this is the this is the early on, so maybe he wouldn't be on top of that. No. Yeah. But, I don't know. It's just, there are many questions and not, not too many answers. Yeah. But that happens a lot. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we cut to outside the bar as Prue walks out, and we see Ray leaning against a wall as Prue walks past, and he's now got on a dark, like, leather jacket. Yeah. He grabs her arm, saying that she's got his money, and when she won't give it back, he threatens to take it out in trade, so he's basically propositioning her for sex. Yeah, and he goes to touch her, but she kicks him in the face. Go, yeah. Prue. Go, Prue. She picks up a piece of scrap and hits him in the stomach, and he falls to the ground unconscious. Prue says, and then, and then um, like, Prue's body language changes, and she says to no one in particular, no, I don't want to go, and then Astral projects out of the scene, and the scrap clatters on the ground next to his body. We cut back to Prue's room as Prue wakes up with a gasp, and we go to the opening credits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this has been real life, not a dream. Yeah. This this has been astral projecting via dream. And that is terrifying. Yeah. No wonder she's so fucking tired. Yeah. So... When we come back from the credits, we get an exterior shot of the manor that pans through the tree with leaves and white flowers, and we find ourselves in Piper's bedroom. Piper is asleep, wearing a really cute long sleeve white top with what look to be purple snowflakes, and there are bunches of red rose petals covering oh, her bed. Oh, it is just loaded. Yeah. Loaded. We hear, like, a white lighter chime that wakes her up, and we see the glob of white orbs dissipating, like, upward... 
yeah, like the from, shot. from from the bed beside her. Yeah, it, it then just kind of trails off into yeah. the air. She sits up and calls out for Leo, and then sees all of the petals and starts giggling. And she like picks up handfuls and shoves them into her face. Yeah, to like sniff them. Mm-hmm. And Phoebe walks in carrying a tray of food and some tea. She's in a black cami top with pink lace trim and pink dots on it, as well as pink pajama pants with hearts all over them. And her hair is back in a ponytail. And she's like, did I hear giggling? And Piper assures her, oh yes, you did. Yeah. And then she says she's the happiest she's ever been. Phoebe says that it's your wedding day, to which Piper responds in the most adorable baby voice. I I know. know. It was so cute. It was. And then Phoebe yells out, here comes the bridesmaid, and leaps onto the bed. Yeah. Prue then comes in, wearing a very skimpy blue shirt with flowers Barely being held on by tiny straps. Like, it it was the skimpiest of shirts. And very sheer peach-colored pajama pants. It is so sheer that we can tell she's wearing a white thong underneath it. Yeah, I wasn't looking for that, but I don't doubt it. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, because, you know, I have to go through a couple of times to... Yeah. Because I write down all of the things. And I happened to pause at just the right moment where it was like, oh. Oh, Okay. Hello, white thong. Thong, 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 thong. <laughs> like, and once you see it, you can't unsee it, you know? No. No. Anyway. Anyway, uh, Phoebe beckons Prue to come play with them and then <laughs> sees that uh, Prue still seems very tired. Prue says that she had the same dream of the biker bar, but this time she was, quote, attacked by a big galoot, unquote. Piper asks what a galoot is. And then when Phoebe shrugs, asks if Prue fought a demon in her sleep. Yeah. So according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a galoot is slang for a fellow, especially one who is strange or foolish. Uh, There was apparently an Israeli documentary from 2003 with galoot as the title that explores the Israeli-Palestinian conflict from the perspective of Palestinian refugees and new immigrants to Israel. I'm not even going to bother putting links to those because I literally just told you everything you need. Mm-hmm. That's it. Anyway. Piper gets defensive about possibly having to fight a demon in her wedding dress. Prue says he wasn't a demon, just a big rude guy. And Phoebe mentions that it was just a dream. Prue says that she just needs to the vanquishing power of the potion known as coffee. And, and then, then the doorbell the door rings. rings. She says it must be the flowers, tells Piper to relax and not worry. Phoebe tells Piper to eat her breakfast and she'll go draw her a bubble bath. And crawls, like, off the bed really hilariously. Yeah. And Piper asks if they're sure that nothing witchy is going on. Prue throws petals over Piper, telling her that she's positive nothing witchy is going on. And then she and Phoebe leave the room. And and we end with Piper, surrounded by flower petals, sighing contentedly. Mm Mm-hmm. It was sweet. Mm Mm-hmm. We then cut to photographer taking pictures of Ray, seemingly dead from a stab wound. As he leaves our view, we pan down to see police tape and cops interviewing people, and a yellow tarp is placed over the body as we then cut to a small black and white TV showing Prue hitting Ray, just like in her dream. We see TJ sitting at the bar, and a detective is asking him questions, so I might as well tell you about this actor while we're here. His name is Whip. Hubley. That's a fun name. Yep. Again, no rip torn. Yep. He was born Grant Shelby Hubley in 1957 in New York. He's got 54 acting credits between 1985 and 2013. And I vaguely remembered his face from the two episodes of Dead at 21 that he was on, but that's about it. Yeah, of course you would. Yeah. I anyway. still miss Dead at 21. It was such a good show, and I'm so sad I can't find it anywhere. Anyway. Anyway, he asks TJ if that's the woman he was with the night before and what her name is. TJ says that he was with her, but he doesn't know her name, which seems to annoy the detective. He said something like, like, like you'll stick your tongue down her, th- down her throat, but you won't know her, like you don't know her name or something like that. And he goes, is that illegal? It was, it was a very like, yeah, you go TJ kind of moment. Yeah. TJ, anyway, TJ says he's not the murderer, and then a biker walks up to them and tells the detective that he knows what happens. He saw it with his own eyes. He says that the woman in the video is the killer. Now, Biker Dude had a couple of lines, but he is on IMDb as uncredited. This character is apparently named Jack, and the actor is Frank Ross, and that's Frank with a C. 
He was born in 1954 in California and has 53 acting credits between 1988 and 2017. He played the character of Razor in Bargaining Parts 1 and 2 in Buffy in uh, 2001 and Monty Reynolds in the Firefly episode of Trash in 2003. Yep. So Monty. We get an exterior shot of the manor. Prue and Phoebe are in the kitchen. Prue is sitting at the table and Phoebe is standing behind her. Phoebe is now in an orange tank top under tan overalls with her hair down. Prue is in a sleeveless top with argyle print in blue and green diamonds on the front and it's white on the back and she's paired this with jeans and I really liked this top. It was okay. Like, a lot. It didn't seem very much like a Prue top, but I liked it. Mm -hmm. It seemed more of a Piper top. Yeah. Yeah. It was very classic and like clean lines. Yeah. You know? Uh, on the table, we can see there's a bouquet of off-white roses with some other white flowers and some candle holders. Phoebe says that she found something in the attic, which Prue hopes is old because they already have new borrowed and blue covered. This is, of course, from the traditional wedding day rhyme, something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue, and a silver sixpence in her shoe. Though most people forget about the sixpence part. Yeah, I didn't know about that part. Yeah. The old item was to provide protection for the baby to come. The borrowed item was supposed to come from another happy bride to provide good luck. The color blue was a sign of fidelity, and the sixpence was a symbol of prosperity. I will link to that, of course, on the website. Then what's the old thing? Provide protection. No, sorry, the, the new thing. The new thing is usually the wedding dress. That, okay, yeah. Um, well, I mean, just like, what's the symbology of the new thing? Did it not say? No, it didn't. But usually the symbology of the new thing is it's a new thing. It's, it's That's fair. For, for the new. Mm -hmm. Phoebe says that she found Melinda Warren's blessing cup, which was apparently from Melinda's wedding, and Prue picks it up. And it looks like a crystal wine glass with a little bit of color on the top after the glass. It, it looks like you could have gotten it at TJ Maxx. That's exactly the thought I had. Like, legit the exact thought it, I had. It, I'm like, I think I could have picked that up at the store last week. Oh, my God. This is not, like, it doesn't even look old. It, it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't look, look like old. it could have survived several hundred it's years. It's a fucking wine glass. Like, stemmed wine glass. Like, there very is no, tall stemmed wine glass, there granted. There is no way. I'm sorry. And, and I understand it's very pretty. And I get that. But there is no way that would have been Melinda Warren's cup at her wedding they would have had a a small like possibly metal probably wood mm -hmm. cup like, i would i would go for metal honestly if it's, Although, your, if granted, it's your wedding it would probably yeah. have a lead in it so you wouldn't want to use it too much well there is that but yeah like there is no way that melinda warren would have had this like crystal wine glass i'm sorry nope like no i call bullshit yeah no anyway Prue checks it off the list and then asks for help moving the buffet table. Phoebe asks if they can wait for Cole to get there. Much to Prue's, Prue's annoyance. annoyance. And Phoebe reminds her that he's coming for the wedding. Prue says she knows that, but the moments leading up to the wedding are just for family, which he is not. She starts to say that they don't need a demon in the house before the wedding, and then they hear Piper scream. We cut over to the stairs where Piper is hiding from Leo behind the railing. He's wearing a gray t-shirt under a brown gingham button-down shirt with khaki pants. She is in a blue robe with curlers in her hair. <laughs> and she says it's bad luck for him to see her dress before the wedding. And he says... He's like, you're not in your dress. And she says the rule applies to her curlers as well and tells him to go away and, and then, then runs back up the stairs. It was the cutest thing ever. Uh-huh. So adorable. Yeah, he smiles as he watches her go, and Phoebe and Prue walk in, happy to see him. He says he needs a place to change, and he holds up a white, white lighter robe. Yeah. It's, like, kind of sparkly. Yeah, a little little shimmery. Yeah. Phoebe says that they thought he should be a little more traditional, and so they rented him a tux. She then grabs the robe from him with a smile, and there was, like, a little bit of tug-of-war happening yeah. just for a moment. And then Victor enters the manor, holding a garment bag. He's in jeans, a red shirt, and a leather jacket. And Phoebe runs over to hug him hello. Yelling, Daddy! Yeah, still holding the robe from Leo. They walk over to the stairs, and Victor and Leo exchange a curt hello. And then Victor kisses Prue on the top of her head. Prue starts to say something to Victor about sharing love and joy, and then sits down on the stairs due to an apparent dizzy spell. 
She says that she's been getting them ever since the dreams started. Leo asks about the dreams, but she blows him off. And then Phoebe tells Leo that there's nothing to worry about. She tells Prue to sit and relax and takes Leo and Victor down to the basement to change. She tells him to go get dressed and not to fight, and we are shown a tux hanging on a rack. Victor makes a crack, saying he thought that Leo would be wearing, quote, one of those long robes all you white lighters love so much. <laughs> Leo says he decided to go a little more traditional. And he starts to get undressed. Mm. And it was this moment, like this entire scene was one of my favorite moments. Mm -hmm. Where it was just like, I, I, here's the robe that I'll be wearing to the wedding. No, Leo. We bought you, we, we rented you a tux. Victor, I thought you'd be wearing one of those robes. Nope, I'm wearing this tux. <laughs> it was, it was just so cute. It was, it was lovely. Anyway, we cut back to Prue and Phoebe, who is no longer holding the robe. She probably, probably threw it in the laundry room or something. Yeah, I was going to say, don't know where she, where she left it. She sits down on the stairs next to Prue. She asks Prue to convince her that everything is under control. But, but Prue, Prue says, says she, she can't. can't. She says that she's tired all the time, that her dreams are so real that she's not really getting any rest, and it's like being awake 24 hours a day. Phoebe then asks if the dream sorcerer is back, which is a callback to episode 105, and while Prue isn't ruling it out, she really doesn't think so. Phoebe reminds Prue that Piper will call off the wedding if one more thing goes wrong, which Prue is adamant about not happening, and Phoebe tells Prue to give her the to-do list and she should go and try to get some rest, but not sleep. Right. Just rest. Prue gives in without any hesitation, which Phoebe takes to mean that she really is tired. Oh, yeah. Prue goes upstairs. Phoebe picks up a photo of Patty, asking their mom to help them get through the day. And we and cut, we cut, over, cut over to, to Prue's, Prue's bedroom. Prue is lying on her bed, fully clothed, next to a pink dress on a hanger, laying on the bed. And she struggles to get comfortable, and then she closes her eyes. Because, of course, she can't lay in bed and not sleep. Exactly. Or at least not fall asleep. Yeah. We cut to Astral Prue appearing in the bar wearing the exact same clothes as before. She's in a little alcove with a payphone and a poster of Cher on the wall. Now, I'm not going to tangent even though I really want to. Did you know that Cher is 72? Yep. Wow. I'll put links to Cher on the website. Still because... an amazing Twitter presence. Yeah. Possibly the best Twitter presence of anyone her age. Yeah. 72. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, she walks past a pool table, and then TJ grabs her arm from behind. He's now in a red plaid shirt under his leather jacket, and she turns around happy to see him, but he says that she shouldn't have come back. And at this point, they're standing in front of a poster for the Bare Naked Ladies. Yeah, I'm, I know that I've tangented on them before, so I'm not going to tangent again. I'm not even going to bother linking, but I couldn't not mention it, because it yeah. was prevalent. Yeah. Like, it was just right there between their heads, Bare Naked Ladies. I'm like... All right. <laughs> TJ tells Prue that he spent the whole morning talking to cops who think that she killed a man and took his money. She says that she didn't kill anyone, which he seems happy about, and then asks why he's still there. He tells her he was waiting for her, since he didn't have her phone number or even her name. She says that that's the sexiest thing a man's ever done for her, and she kisses him. He says that if she wants to live a life with no rules and no responsibilities, then this is it. And he grabs her hand, and they walk off screen. We get a shot of Jack noticing them with an audio cue and everything, and uh -huh. he's wearing a long green jacket. Yeah, it's a very, like, noticeable, like, army green, yeah. like... It's the kind like of, like... breaker. Yeah, where it has, like, the little ruching of, like, elastic at the waist. Yeah. Yeah. TJ takes Prue outside, and they get onto his motorbike, and that's how you know that I did not write that word. Yeah. Because that says motorbike. I would have written motorcycle. Yeah. Thank you, the British writers. <laughs> who bike. This, this transcript. Bicycle. It's a, it's a, it's a bicycle. It's a bicycle. Motorbike. Motorbike. Uh, but yeah, so they get on his motorcycle, uh, just as a car pulls up, and the detective from earlier gets out, tells them to take it easy, as his hand rests on his back pocket. And now I immediately assumed he was like resting his hand on a gun, yeah. but he wasn't. He was at his back That's pocket. That's weird. Yeah. Another police car pulls up, and Prue basically tells TJ not to get arrested for her, 
And then the detective tells him not to be an accessory for murder, and he gets out his handcuffs. So that's what he was grabbing from yeah. his back pocket, was handcuffs. And at this point, Prue whispers her full name into TJ's ear. Yeah. Not her middle name, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and then gets off the bike and walks over toward the detective. He, she puts her hands up, and he cuffs her and walks her off screen. And we cut to Prue's room as Phoebe walks in and tries to wake Prue up. We cut back to the bar as the inspector puts Prue in the car. Cut back to Prue's room for a second, and then back to her in the car. Yeah. She says, oh, oh no. no, and then Astral projects out of the car, leaving the handcuffs behind. The inspector, who had walked away, now comes back and notices that she's gone and sees the handcuffs lying on the back seat. And we cut to Prue's room, where she wakes up with a gasp, looks at her wrists, says another, oh, no, and we go to commercial break. That's a quite the Houdini moment. Yeah. When we come back, we get an exterior shot of the manor, from the side with the street lamp. Yes. I love, I don't know why, but I love seeing that side of the house. Yeah. We don't nice see it shot. very often. Yeah. But it's, I like, I like looking at the house yeah, from like that from direction. it's like from the other side of the driveway. Yeah. For some reason, I just, I enjoy that view of the house a lot. And we don't get to see it very much. No, we don't. But anyway, we are um, in Prue's room where Prue and Phoebe are standing. We can see some lovely furniture that we apparently haven't seen before. Yeah, there's a couple of chairs, and there's a desk, and there's, like, a lovely little rug. Mm -hmm. It's it's like we just, we don't normally see Prue's room from this vantage point looking at the windows. And for half a second, I thought they were in the living room. Yeah. And then I was like, no, that's not living room furniture. Well, no, no, it's directly above the living room. Right. Because it's the same view from outside, kind of, but it's higher up. Yeah. But, yeah. Anyway, Prue is telling Phoebe about her dream and says that she didn't want to wake up like her dreams were overpowering her. Phoebe says that that's like her premonitions, uh, that that her premonitions feel like they're pulling her against her will, which is the first time that we're hearing that that's how that feels for her. Yeah, that explains the gasp. Mm-hmm. It does. And then Prue says that someone might be trying to pull her into a parallel world or a dream dimension, and Phoebe says she'll check the Book of Shadows. They start heading for the attic, and Phoebe wonders if they should tell Piper... Prue says that she doesn't want this to be the thing that makes the day go wrong and that everything should be fine as long as she stays awake. And then they have a for Piper, for Piper kind of moment, like that okay, okay from from Tiffios. Yeah. And, and then, then Piper comes out of her room, still in her robe, but now her hair is half up, half down, and slightly curled, and it seems way longer than normal. Yeah. It's like she added extensions, but she didn't. It's just weird, because it's yeah. like, for some reason, it's curled, but yet longer. And that's not normally how curls work. Mm -hmm. It's really funny. Every time I straighten my hair, people ask me if I got it cut. Yeah. And I'm like, no, no. it's longer. <laughs> like, you just normally see it up. Yeah. Or curled. Yeah. Which is funny, because when I get it curled, people don't ask if it's been cut. No. Just when it's straightened. Yep. I don't get it. It's because they're not used to seeing it straightened. It might be like, because of the edge. Maybe. Like, when, when I got my hair redone the last time, I went from having, you know, dark, dark roots to then being my entire head was blue. Yeah. And someone goes, did you get your hair cut? And I was like, nope, just re-dyed it. It's really funny when people notice something different but can't figure out what the difference put is. Put a pin in yeah. what it is. It reminds me of that, that joke Cameron Esposito has where people could tell that she, like, acted differently like she wasn't she wasn't coding how they thought like a little girl should be coding so they called her fat because um. they couldn't they couldn't figure out what was going on hmm and so that was the route that they went she's like no I was not a chubby kid they just called me fat because they couldn't do anything else yeah fat is not an insult people knock it off yeah it was just yeah it's just weird how people redirect mm-hmm they're like, well, I don't know what to call this, so I will call it something I know, but I know it isn't that, just so you know. Yeah. It's just something. Yeah. I do think it's funny, though, that next time I'm dyeing my hair, I will be cutting it, so. Yeah. That'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. That's coming up. Yep. Anyway. Anyway, uh, Piper immediately knows something is wrong. Phoebe tries to cover by saying that there's too many boy bands, which I thought was hilariously funny. But Piper says that they've been demon hunting for three years, and she can tell when they're going to the attic. Phoebe relents, saying that they are, which earns her an elbow in the side from Prue. Phoebe tells Prue that since Piper is on to them, they might as well come clean. That they were going to the attic to find her something old, new, borrowed, and blue, and that it was going to be a surprise, but she caught them. Prue tells Piper not to worry about anything, and that it's going to be a demon-free day. 
Just as Cole shimmers in next to Piper, scaring the shit out of her. Yeah, he's in a very nice suit. He apologizes for being very late. Very nice suit with a very, very wide tie. Yeah, it was kind of super wide. Yeah. He apologizes for being late, walks over to Phoebe, who gives him a kiss. And he says that he had a near miss with a Zotar, which is a reminder of Krell, the demonic bounty hunter. But he says that he thinks he lost them. Piper thinks that it's the natural order of the universe that a demon will attack today, and Phoebe tells her to be positive. And then she asks if Piper would like to watch the behind the music of Celine Dion that she has on video cassette. Yep. Which prompts Piper to ask if she wants to get slapped. Best response ever. Yep. Now, video cassette is, of course, videotape. It's what we had before DVDs and Blu-rays. Video gonna... cassette recorder. Yep. VCR. Exactly. I'm not going to tangent on it. I will link to the wiki on the website. Celine Dion is a French-Canadian singer born in 1968, and she is stupid popular. Now, I won't tangent on her. I, I will just link to her wiki, but I will also link to the newest music video that she did, which was for the song Ashes from the Deadpool 2 movie, uh -huh. because it is brilliant. Oh, yeah. And, like, the last 10 seconds or so... The, the interaction that she and Deadpool have is by far the best part in the entire thing for me, and it's not even mm -hmm. part of the song. Yeah. But it's a really good song. I love that it's it's obviously not going to be Ryan Reynolds who's, like... Doing the dancing, in, no. In the, doing the dancing in the music video. No. It's clearly they got some guy mm -hmm. who dances in heels. Yep. Because yeah. they made heels for Deadpool, and that's and the best part for amazing. me. And it's amazing. Amazing. Yep. Behind the Music was a show on VH1 from 1997 to 2014. It profiled and interviewed a popular music artist or group, showing the beginning of their career, their road to success, and any hardships that they may have encountered along the way. I will link to the wiki and the IMDb for it in case anyone wants to check out who they've profiled. There have been many. Many, many, many. Many, many, many. Mm -hmm. anyway, anyway, Prue says that Phoebe was just trying to relax Piper, which Piper then responds to with, with a, a growl. growl. Yeah, Cole says that he can handle any demons coming through. Phoebe reminds him that he promised not to use his demonic powers, and he apologizes, citing old habits, and she tells him to think good. He tells her he is, and that he brought a gift, which he then chucks, chucks at, at Piper. Piper. Like, she catches it, but with a grimace. And it's, like, a very nicely wrapped present. Like, mm -hmm. it's it's kind of vaguely cream-colored. Yeah. And the wrapping has, like, flowers on it or something, and yeah. there's a ribbon. Yeah, it was a nicely wrapped present, but it just... It, it was, was smaller than a bread box. Yes. Yes, it was. It was just hilarious, because he literally just chucks at her. Underhand. Like, I brought a gift. Here. Psh. No, no. Throw in, the, throw in the football. Underhand. It was an underhanded chuck. It was underhanded. Mm-hmm. But, um, pss. Yeah. We cut to the basement where Leo and Victor are finishing getting dressed. Victor is tying his bow tie, and Leo is fixing his vest. And Victor asks if he and Piper are going to move out and get their own place. When Leo says that they won't right away, Victor asks if living off the girls is hurting his pride. Leo says that he knows Victor isn't happy with his daughter marrying a white lighter, which Victor is quick to point out that he never said out loud, mm -hmm. but that he would prefer Piper marry a mortal, and Leo reminds Victor that Piper herself isn't mortal. Yeah, he says that she's a witch and was given her gifts to serve a higher calling. Victor bitterly says that if it's a calling, only quote-unquote people, people like, like you, you could understand, saying that it's the same crap line his ex-wife's white lighter used to steal her away from him. Leo says that he's sorry about that, but with all due respect, this isn't about Victor and Patty. It's about Leo and Piper. And he is right. Yes. He he's says that he loves her with all his heart, promises to keep loving her and taking care of her for, quote, the rest of this life, the afterlife, and whatever comes after that, unquote. And that has got to be the sweetest statement it was really cute. ever. This life, the afterlife, and whatever comes after that. You know, the eventual heat death of the universe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, he says that while Victor may not support or agree with it, nothing is going to stop him from marrying Piper today. And Victor seems to soften at this, saying that he could get used to having a white lighter for a son-in-law and helps Leo tie his bow tie. And then Cole kind of, like, 
pokes go, his head down he the pokes stairs. His head, like, it's really funny. He, like, puts his hands on the railings, and he's, like, leaning down in that way that I remember doing on stair railings. Yeah, and he's just like, you know, everything and cool? And he, yeah, and then Leo asks Victor what his stand is on demons, and Victor's face just goes super alarmed. Yeah, it was perfection. It was. Best scene ever. Yeah. Love it. And then we cut to upstairs. Prue walks downstairs from the attic as Phoebe comes around the corner, and she asks if Prue found anything in the book about her dreams, which Prue did not. And then she asks what she's going to do, because the wedding is in 30 minutes. Prue says, get ready, get set, get through it. And we get another Four Piper moment. And, and then they, they head, head in different, different directions. And then we cut to Piper's room. Piper is in her wedding dress. Yeah. It's a lovely floor-length sleeveless white dress. It's lace on the top and plain on the bottom. And she's wearing pearl bracelets and is adding pearl earrings as she walks over to her mirror. And it like the the skirt is basically just tulle, kind of like a little bell shaped. Was it like t- it was like satiny a little bit? No, it had like a tulle overlay. I'm pretty sure. There might yeah, there might have been an overlay. Mm-hmm. It was just very plain on the bottom. Yeah, it wasn't embellished. Right. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't like plain per se because having the tulle there doesn't. But like it's a it was a pretty short bodice because I think that was the style. Yeah. It was very nice. Yeah, and we can see that her hair is is pulled in that half up, half down, but it's kind of like twisted, twisted a little bit. Yeah, and it's it's one of those where where you look at that and you go, "That's a wedding hairstyle," mm-hmm. because like you know that there's going to be a veil attached to that hair. Yeah. Anyway, we see uh, Patty appear behind her, not glowing, not glowing, not see through, just. Patty. Mm -hmm. Wearing a light yellow top and a light green skirt. It was very neutral colors that felt like they were taken from swatches out of the 70s, but the clothes themselves weren't necessarily all that 70s. Yeah, they were were kind of very classic. It was very neutral. But it didn't seem very wedding. No. It was very casual. Mm -hmm. Which was a little weird for me. The top is like a, a, a... like a half sleeve length that like goes to yeah. her elbows. Yeah, it was like a like a yeah half sleeve, but it it seemed just like a very casual outfit. I mean, instead of she's dead, she doesn't have time to go shopping. Maybe Grams hasn't taught her all the ins and outs of changing her clothes <laughs> as a spirit. Maybe, but that's the granted thing. she'd been there longer, so I don't know why she hasn't learned. Well, anyway, reminder that you can check episode one seventeen for all of the inf- info on Finola Hughes, who plays Patty. Piper is looking down, so she doesn't even notice that Patty is there until Patty says that Piper looks beautiful. Piper then, turns around and immediately, like, starts to cry a little bit. Yeah. She's like, you're not glowing. You're not a ghost. Yeah, she's like, uh, ghosts glow and you're not glowing. What the fuck is happening, basically. Yeah. Patty says that today she's not a ghost. She's simply her mother. Mm-hmm. And when she's Piper... So sweet is wondering about how that's happening, and the tears are really starting to come now. Mm-hmm. Patty says that after all the elders put her and Leo through, they wanted to give something back and sent her down just for her wedding day. And then she notices Piper's hair, saying that she wore hers the same way for her wedding. And Piper says she knows she kept her wedding album after Patty died and would look at the pictures every night like a bedtime story. Which is slightly sad, but still kind of adorable. Uh-huh. Patty then does the mother thing. Yeah. Like, the stereotypical mother moment. She licks her finger and then pushes a piece of Piper's hair into place. Yeah, there's, like, a... I, I think probably someone... For, they Like, when they when they cut the scene, they're like, okay, pause, and then had someone from hair to come in and just, like, pull a little bit out of place. Yeah. Because it was just, like, this one little loop on the top that was just a little bit out. And yeah. you'd, like, normally get, like, a, a tail brush to push that under the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah. Just that little, like, let's just move this little hair out the way. Uh-huh. But it was the licking of the finger where I was like, oh, that's such a mom thing. hmm Yeah. Patty says that she always thought Piper would be the first to get married since she's the heart of the family. And then Piper touches Patty's hand, wondering if she's dreaming. And when Patty assures her that she's not, they hug. And Piper is still trying very hard not to cry. Very, very hard. We see the door open and Prue and Phoebe walk in, both in their pink bridesmaids dresses. Phoebe's looks like it has a red flower design on the bust that Prue's doesn't have, but both are spaghetti strap on one side and a cloth tie on the other with a scoop neck. And they're really pretty, actually. They are. I feel like, I feel I like they're technically like spaghetti strap on both sides and then just the, the, the 
the cloth is like gathered up from the the rest of the dress just to overlay that on could, top of it or something. That could be, but it's it's definitely you can see a yeah. spaghetti a spaghetti strap on one side and a cloth tie on the other. Yes, spaghetti. It's a skinny strap. Skinny, but this skinny. Prue's hair is pulled slightly up with a barrette on each side. Phoebe's hair, however, is pulled back into a fancy ponytail with a matching clip to Prue's with just a little few, like, bangs falling out from a headband of beaded roses. Mm -hmm. And Phoebe is holding Melinda's cup, but it's never Never really mentioned mentioned why. why. And we never see it again. Nope. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, they are surprised to see Patty. Piper assures them it's really her. And now they're all holding back tears. Patty Patty goes to Prue, saying that everything's been hard and unfair for her, but Prue says that she just wanted to make Patty proud. Patty says that Prue protected the family better than she ever could, and she's so proud. And then they hug. And then Patty goes over to Phoebe, realizes that she gets all the feels, feels. knowing she wasn't there to comfort her since she died before Phoebe could get to know her. Patty says that she was never worried about Phoebe because she had a premonition on the day Phoebe was born, which surprises everybody. Oh, yeah. And when they ask what it was, Patty says it was this moment with her three daughters standing before her as beautiful young women and knowing that everything would be okay. And they and all then hug. And they all hug and it was so big, cute and adorable. Big, big ass hug. Yeah. We then cut downstairs and Leo is standing in front of the arch and the altar from the beginning of the episode. And then Grams appears wearing a pink outfit with matching jewelry and tells everyone to get to their places. We see Prue and Phoebe standing off to the side, holding their little bouquets. And now we can see that Prue's dress also has that same, like, red flowers as a pattern detail, but it's lower down, so I hadn't noticed it before. Yeah. While Phoebe's is mostly at the bust line and looks very nice, Prue's is unfortunately placed at the groin. Yep. A little late for that dress. Yeah, it um, was... And I only noticed this later in the episode, mm. after she gets up from lying down for a while, and I, th- for a split second, I thought it was, like, some sweat stains that they just couldn't get out. No. No. No, that's part of the dress. Yeah, it's it's a red flower at the groin, and that is just not a place that anyone should ever put red yeah. on, on, a, on a dress. No. Like, don't do it. No. Don't Although, it. honestly, camouflage. Well, you know. Yeah. But anyway, anyway, Victor and Cole are awkwardly standing on the other side of the room. And then in the wide shot, we can see that all we get is Grams from the waist up. Like she's behind that table or something? Yeah, it was a little odd. It was funny. It was, but it was just one of those where like, like her body is literally cut off at the table. And it was just, so you, you have you have the two guys standing over here, you have the two girls standing over there, you have Leo standing, and then you get half of grams. <laughs> and it was just an odd, like, visual moment. Yeah, just getting half a gram. The doorbell then rings, and Prue says that no one should answer it. And but then, then she... Piper calls down from upstairs for someone to answer it. So Prue says that she'll get it. And it's Daryl. He's in a lovely gray suit with a red shirt. Prue asks where he was as he is late, and he says he was saving her ass. She seems confused by this, and he says that the police have her picture, and she's wanted for murder, and fled custody that morning. Phoebe realizes that this is the same thing that happened in Prue's dream, as Daryl mentions that they don't have her name yet, but they will soon enough. Grams then calls out to them, and the girls ask Daryl if they can get through the wedding first. And she and Phoebe exchange the Four Piper line, and then they're slightly upset when Daryl doesn't say Four Piper. (laughs) It was kind of funny. He says that it better be a quick wedding, and they head to the room to stand in their spots. Graham says that everyone looks perfect, but asks that Victor move a little to his left. He's confused as to why, until Graham's motions to the stairs, and Patty walks in. He wonders who brought his ex-wife back from the dead, but Grams tells him that they'll have to deal with their issues during the reception. After like all, any good family. That's what they're for. Exactly. Graham starts the music with a flick of her wrist toward the CD player, and Pockabill's cannon starts playing. Yep, cannon and D. Now, I'm not That's sure... Pockabill. Well, I'm not sure if it's the same thing that played when the show originally aired. Oh, it is. Or if it's a song on the DVD. Okay. It is. I, I wasn't sure. I knew it was the one on Netflix, I don't even have to listen possible. to the DVD to know that's what it is, because um, it's in public domain. There will okay. be no copyright issue. Okay. I Pockabell's wasn't sure. been dead for far too long, and I wish I could bring him back and kill him again. <laughs> 
I mean, it's it's not the traditional wedding march, which is often called Here Comes the Bride, but it's a very pretty song. It's like the secondary traditional but I think, wedding thing. Yeah. I think that you have the same, like, visceral reaction to Canon and D that I have to Amazing Grace. Like, okay. if I never hear this song again, it will be too soon. Amazing Grace is one of those songs that it wasn't around when I was a kid. It wasn't sung all the fucking time. And now it's at every goddamn funeral ever. I liked Obama's rendition. Well. That was nice. It was very sweet. But yeah, like, visceral reaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, ugh, instant hatred. Anyway, I will link to both of these songs' wiki pages on the website, uh, where you can actually listen to them, if you like. They have little midi, like, little MT3 buttons that you can press play and listen to the songs. Yep. Anyway, um, Piper, hearing the music... Walks down the stairs. She's no. now sporting a lovely veil. Yeah, she's holding that's up like bouquet held, of white roses. Held on by like a a ring ring of of white. Like I want to say it was like white flowers. Yeah, there were like white flowers on it. Yeah, it was like a plastic ring covered in white flowers. Yeah, fabric flowers. Victor walks over to her and she holds onto his arm and he takes her up to Leo. Phoebe, Phoebe says like, it's, it's really, really happening. happening. And, and then, then both the front doors get kicked open and a motorcycle comes roaring through. Yeah. And as we see a slow-mo shot of Piper looking shocked, we see this motorcycle drive through a doorway, run over a bit of cloth, and then some flowers and a table, making a pyramid of wine glasses go crashing to the floor. Why were that, there are that many wine glasses? For the effect. Yeah, for the effect. The table breaks, which brings our FAQ to 12 for the season and 38 for the series. He stops just short of the table, like, does that thing where he, like, breaks and spins around halfway. Yeah. And then so yells. It, it's like he it, stops right in front of the table with the cake on it. So you immediately are like, well, this is going to end badly. Yep. And we can now see that it's TJ as he calls out for Prue. Phoebe asks who the hell he is. Prue starts to panic and then falls to the floor as everyone looks on. Except, apparently, TJ. Because he doesn't fucking notice her. Because then Astro Prue appears, wearing the exact same outfit as before, and runs over to TJ. I'm still confused by this. Like, how does he not realize that Prue is standing there in a bridesmaid dress and then just shows up wearing the same outfit she was in before? Does does he think Prue has a twin sister? He's been inhaling too many bike fumes. Yeah. Anyway, Grams, of course, gasps, as Grams is wont to do. Yeah. As grabs Prue... a helmet and gets on the back of the bike. TJ says, he won't let the cops get her. And then Piper asks what the hell is going on. Phoebe tells Prue to get her astral ass back here. And then TJ rides off. And, and we see that a bit of cloth is stuck in his bike, which pulls the three-tiered wedding cake. Or, well, it pulls one of the legs of the table, right. holding the three-tiered wedding cake and it all goes crashing to the ground yeah. as they ride out the front door. Piper then gasps, Cole and Daryl look dumbfounded, and Grams gasps again. Piper thrusts her bouquet into Leo, and takes walks off over. the veil, yeah. and then walks over to see the aftermath of the cake on the floor. She throws the veil on the ground and yells that the wedding is, is off. off. She tries to walk away, but Phoebe is standing on her dress, and we hear like a little tear. It's kind of funny. And then Phoebe, like, apologizes and backs off. Piper walks off and we see Prue's body lying on the floor. And then Phoebe steps over Prue to go after Piper, trying to get her to wait and think and whatever. And we go to commercial break. When we come back, we are in the scene continued right from before. Piper Piper is is putting on a pink cardigan and heading toward the door. Phoebe comes over saying that she can't leave. Piper says that she could have handled the demon, but not her big sister ruining her wedding. Phoebe says they'll find a way. And Piper says that it's too hard and there must be a reason for all of this. Leo then walks over to them, still holding Piper's bouquet. And she tells him that this was the final straw. She walks out of the manor and we're left with Phoebe and Leo standing in the foyer. We cut to the living room as Victor lays Prue on the couch and Patty is standing behind him. And then Leo and Phoebe walk in and Leo sits into one of the comfy chairs. Phoebe sits by Prue's feet and tries to wake her, but Patty says that a part of Prue wanted to escape, and it used her actual self to do it. Graham says that if the wedding is off, that she has to leave, and she disappears. Because she's only there for the ceremony. Right. 
She disappears, and Victor says that maybe Piper is right about it not being meant to be, which Patty starts to object to, but he says that the gods may be trying to spare them the same pain that he and Patty went through. Leo gets real mad at that, mm -hmm. saying that he knows he and Piper are meant to be together. He stands up, and Phoebe joins him in saying that they have to fix this. Daryl's pager beeps, and he says that he has to go fend off the posse. <laughs> which kind of reminded was... me of last episode. Yeah, a little bit. And then, you know, tells them that Prue is wanted for murder. Mm -hmm. He says that he'll stay in touch via cell phone, and then leaves. Patty questions this whole Prue is wanted for murder thing. Leo asks Phoebe about it, and she says that she only found out when Prue was told about it. Phoebe says that it's an obvious mistake, as Prue would never kill anyone. Cole asks if she's sure, since Prue's astral form has taken on a life of its own, and Phoebe says that she thinks she knows her sister. Leo tells Victor and Patty to go find Piper, tells Phoebe to see if there's a spell in the Book of Shadows to bring Astral Prue back, and tells Cole to come with him to do some investigating, because there's a wedding to see. And they head off in their respective directions. Now, reminder that just last week, Leo was like, I can't work with Cole, he's a demon. And now that his wedding is in jeopardy, come Cole, let's do some working. I think... I understand that it was more about the, I can't be, you know, shimmered by yeah. a demon. I yeah. get that. But it was just that little, like, yeah. hmm, when it's your wedding in Priorities. Jeopardy. Yeah. It was just kind of funny to me. It was like, hmm, all right, Leo. We cut over to the bar where we see a couple of people on motorcycles taken off. And then Are they inside. playing card games? What? Card games on motorcycles. I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh... Yu-Gi-Oh! The Abridged Series. That explains why I have no idea what you're talking about. They're the ones who came up with leather pants. Okay. It's my favorite version of the Lady Gaga song. Got it. Mm -hmm. But no, there's literally just a thing where they edit a bunch of shots of people talking so that it's them yelling, Card games on motorcycles! Because okay. apparently that's one of the versions of Yu-Gi-Oh! They're playing card games on motorcycles. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Anyway. anyway. Inside, in the same spot Astral Prue appeared in before, Cole shimmers in and then Leo orbs in right afterward. Right. Both men have, for some reason, removed their ties. Well, they're not going to fit into a biker bar wearing ties. I get it. It was just an odd, like, moment where it was like, all of a sudden, ties are gone. Mm-hmm. Okay. They Symbology! Both... Yep. They both think that this is an interesting place for Prue to be dreaming about, and they start to walk around. We get a bit of exposition from Cole that, that supposedly came from Daryl, but we're not sure when this was supposed to happen because he left mm -hmm. before verbally mentioning that someone knifed the victim after Astral Prue walked away. Leo says that anyone here could have done it, but Cole says that very few humans have the heart of a true killer. And he can always sense the ones who do before he suppressed his demonic half for Phoebe. Yeah. We then get shown Jack walking away from the camera, but in that distinctive green jacket we saw him in earlier, and he sits down at the bar. Cole then mentions that there's someone in the bar with fresh blood on his hands, which doesn't necessarily make him the murderer, but that Leo should go get Daryl. Leo walks off, and we see Jack at the bar again. We cut over to an exterior shot of P3 with the neon lit up for some reason. Yep, there's no now appearing sign anywhere to be seen. Patty and Victor walk down the stairs, Patty asking to be the one who does the talking, since Victor always said the wrong thing when they were married. He says that she thinks he said the wrong things because he wanted to raise them as witches instead of little girls, and then we see Piper sitting at the bar. Yep, she looks very sad. They walk over to her, saying that they were worried about her, she apologizes for letting everyone down, and Victor says that she has nothing to apologize for, and then he lovingly takes a bar stool down for Patty to sit down. It was really sweet. Mm -hmm. Patty says that it's a tribute that she and Leo made it as far as they did, but Piper is upset that they didn't make it all the way, and that it's obvious that they were clearly not destined to be. Patty says that she doesn't believe that and doesn't think that Piper does either. Piper says that she just has to look at the Halliwell track record to see that they're all destined to end up alone, and she says that they are blessed as witches and cursed as women. Patty is at a loss of words, so she turns over to Victor, and he asks if Piper really thinks that he and Patty were cursed, because he looks back at those days as the best of his life. He He's... tells her that 
Patty was the best thing that happened to him until the girls came along, which seems to surprise Patty. Yeah. Piper reminds him that his marriage didn't last, and he says that while it hurt a lot, their love gave birth to her and her sisters, and that might have been his destiny. Piper asks to be alone and walks off. Patty applauds Victor for his words, and he just hopes that they helped. We go back to the living room at the manor, where Phoebe is sitting in a chair flipping through the Book of Shadows. She finds a spell. We can't really see it. Right. But then she glances over at Prue and says, like, gotcha or something. Yeah. And we see that Prue is now lying under a blanket. We are never shown the spell no. that she finds. We then cut to TJ and Prue in some park. In a, the dark. A, in the dark. I got a bit of a cabin in the woods vibe. A little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Who's controlling the uh, pheromones coming out of those trees, huh? Mm-hmm. TJ, TJ is lying down, and Prue is sitting on top of him. Well, no, at th- this point she was sitting next to him. She looked like she was sitting on top of him. I think she was sitting next to him. She looked like she was fucking straddling him. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe. I'm pretty sure she was. I finished it this morning. Okay. Either way. Prue's, but anyway, Prue's they're on a there, blanket. They're on a blanket, and his bike is in the background. He asks how she got away from the cops. She says she doesn't really want to talk about it and that she's there with him, so that's all that really matters at this moment. He asks how long she's going to be there. She asks if he cares, and he reminds her that he crashed her sister's wedding and is harboring her from the cops, which is definitely past first date behavior. Uh Uh-huh. She says that she appreciates all that and wonders why he's still talking, and he says he just needs to know if she's going to take off again. She says that she doesn't know, she's just living moment to moment for the first time in her life, and hopes he's cool with that. He says that he is, and they kiss, and we then hear we hear a, whooshing a sound. lovely whooshing sound. And Prue breaks the kiss and starts to freak out. Yeah. He runs a- into the trees. Yeah. He asks what's wrong, and she just kind of runs away into the bushes. like Into the bushes, and starts hugging a tree. Yeah. We hear him, like, calling after her. She hugs this tree, saying she doesn't want to go. But and- it doesn't work, and she astral projects out of the park. <laughs> We cut to the manor as as Prue Astra projects in with her arms still held like they're hugging the tree, yelling, I won't let you take me. And then she looks around and realizes where she is as Phoebe slams the Book of Shadows shut. Prue is indignant, but Phoebe says that Prue destroyed Piper's wedding along with Piper and that she'd better pull herself together, literally. Yeah. Astro Prue then looks at Prue Prime laying on the couch, and she starts to walk away. But Phoebe gets up and grabs her shoulder, and then Prue flips Phoebe onto the ground. Yeah. She grabs Phoebe by the throat and says that Phoebe can't stop her and she's never going back. Phoebe swings her around and onto one of the chairs in the living room. Mm Mm-hmm. And Astro Prue says that she's sick of all the duty and obligation. She just wants to be free, find love, and have a life. Phoebe reminds her that she has responsibilities, whether she likes it or not, to which Astro Prue counters that Phoebe wasn't being responsible when she fell in love with a demon. Phoebe says that she has to let go the whole Cole thing, and she can't be mad at her forever. But Astro Prue says that she was never mad at Phoebe. In fact, she says that she was rooting for Phoebe and Cole, and that Prue Prime was the one who was mad about it. This seems to scare Phoebe, and Astro Prue says that Phoebe risked everything for love, just like Piper and Leo did. And that she dreams of having that kind of freedom, but she's stuck watching her sisters live that dream instead. Phoebe, who has studied Freud in Psych 101, realizes that Astral Prue is Prue's id, and that that's her inner desires, and that Prue Prime is the ego, which is the control factor. Super ego never gets mentioned. Nope. But it's a great podcast. Okay. (laughs) I will link to Freud. I'm not going to tangent on him, but that dude was fucked up. Uh Uh-huh. And wrong about almost everything. Yeah. Astro Prue then jokes that Prue Prime is a big remote control. Always putting her on pause. And Phoebe realizes that Prue's sacrifices over the years have suppressed her inner desires. Astro Astro Prue sits down uh, at Prue Prime's feet and says, Don't tell me, tell her. But Phoebe says that they're both Prue, two sides of the same person, and she has to stop devoting her entire self to the Charmed Ones, or it will literally tear her apart, like it just has. Yeah. Astro Prue then asks if Piper is very mad at her. Phoebe says that she'll get over it because she and Piper are both okay with passion and purpose in their lives. She says that Prue is the reason they have those things, because she took care of them, and now it's their time to take care of her. And then Prue Astro projects back into her body and sits up, and Phoebe welcomes her back. 
Prue thanks her for everything and then walks into the next room seeing the mess and realizes that she wrecked Piper's wedding. Phoebe reminds her that only part of her did it, and Prue asks if it's too late to fix it, at which point all of go the lights out. go out and the front doors burst open. Cops come running in with shotguns and flashlights. It's like SWAT, practically. Yeah. And the detective arrests Prue for murder, and we go to commercial break. Because why wouldn't we? Right? Mm-hmm. We come back to Prue getting her mugshot taken in stereotypical fashion with the number plate on her chest. Police like, have been apparently taking mugshots since, I guess, the 1840s? Yeah. The process wasn't standardized until 1888. Now, believe it or not, there is now a niche market of tabloid journalism in the United States called the mugshot publishing industry that uses mugshots and booking details of people being arrested to make money. They basically force people whose pictures they're using to pay to get them taken down. Oh, that sounds like revenge porn. Yeah. And the worst part is it is totally legal since all of that data. Yeah. Since all of that data is public record. It sucks. And it's horrible. Yeah. And I wish it would go away. But, you know, people will make money Mm -hmm. however they can. Links on the website as per usual. The officer takes her into a room, tells her to sit and wait for an inspector. And the actor that is this officer is a guy named Tom Yee. And he was apparently the motel manager back in episode 121. But for some reason, I failed to mention him back then. Wait, what motel? The one with the warlock who was was obsessed with the with the girl. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was like maybe maybe it was cuz he didn't get a line or a name before he died, but I literally did not that's mention funny. him at all and I think that's interesting. Uh there is a picture of him on the website from that scene uh as I was still doing the picture thing back in season 1. Mhm. Um but yeah. He has 55 acting credits so far starting all the way back in 1996 and he is still acting. But, yeah, I just thought it was very interesting that for some reason I failed to mention him back in 121. I think I wasn't doing as many Mm -hmm. intro things back then. Anyway, Prue sits down and then looks at her reflection and says that it's all our fault. (laughs) We cut to the bar as Leo and Daryl walk in and walk up to Cole, who's just kind of sitting on a stool somewhere. Yeah. Leo tells him that Prue's been booked for murder, so they're running out of time. Daryl mentions that they found the killer killer cole corrects him and says i found a killer as jack gets up and walks toward them daryl asks if cole is going to ask him if he is the killer as jack walks up to them and then he stops stares grabs his cigarette and walks out then there was a weird sound effect Mm -hmm. happening right there like a bit of a music cue yeah it was very very odd cole then thinks that asking him is a great idea finishes his drink and asks them to meet him outside in five minutes. And And then then he follows follows Jack outside. outside. We cut to outside where Jack is smoking this cigarette. Cole walks over to him and asks if that's the spot where they found the body, pointing to the spot right in front of where he's smoking. Mm -hmm. Jack then asks who he is. Cole says he wants to ask him some questions about the murder. And Jack asks for his badge, but Cole says, no, 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 I'm not a cop. He says he's a fortune teller, and he predicts that Jack is going to give him a confession. Jack calls him a funny man, flicks away his cigarette, and starts to walk away. Cole then grabs him. Jack pushes Cole into a motorcycle, and he pulls out a switchblade. A switchblade is those kind of knives that are hidden away until a button lever or switch is activated, and then the blade pops out. And they've been around since the mid-18th century, and were actually banned by Congress in the United States from being manufactured and sold in 1954, which is why they're shown so predominantly in movies from that era as being used by urban youth and young delinquents because they were banned. They Mm -hmm. were bad. They were bad things. Uh, Have they been unbanned since or are they still banned? uh, Well, here's the thing. I will link to the wiki on the website so that you can see if it is legal to own one where you live. Here in Illinois, it is only legal to own a switchblade if you also have a FOID card. Because for some reason, if you're able to own a gun, you can own a switchblade. It's good to know, since I own a switchblade and have a FOID card. That's fun. Yeah. The switchblade that I have is actually part of a lighter, which is nice. kind of amazing. That is cool. Yeah, but I have I have had said switchblade since before I had said FOID card. Don't Shh. at me. Shh. You've got the FOID card now. They I do. don't need to know. I do. 
Anyway, it's just, it's fascinating to see what state has what rule. Like there, there are some where, where it's illegal unless you're on your own property or it's illegal if you're a felon, which makes sense. I mean, that one, absolutely. But then there are some where, where it's perfectly legal as long as it's not concealed. If it's on your belt where it can be seen by everyone, then it's fine. If it's in your pocket, it's illegal. Oh. And that just, it's fascinating how, how the laws are. Yeah. Fascinating. I remember having a bathroom book that had a section of weird laws in different states. Like, so, there was one about a law where cats were supposed to have lights on their tails or something. I remember the illustration for this. I, I don't remember it exactly. I still have this book somewhere. But um, the illustration for this was, like, a little cat where the tail was curled up and holding, like, a traditional lamp. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. And there was something about having poodles at the opera. I think one of my favorites is, I, I want to say it's like in Kentucky or something, you can't have an ice cream cone in your back pocket. Yeah. Which, like, you think about that as like, why in the hell? And then when you actually, like, look into it, apparently people were stealing horses by putting ice cream cones in their back pocket and, like, walking backwards up to a horse and getting the horse to eat the ice cream and then walking away, making the horse follow them. That's hilarious. And they were stealing horses that way. And the fact that that's, like, they, they didn't make a rule of you can't steal horses. They made a rule of you can't have ice cream in your back pocket. Like, this is just, it's so they weird. They probably argued, oh, we're not stealing the horse. The horse is following us and we kept them. Exactly. Exactly. And so like, they I had to make. I didn't lead the horse away, the horse followed me mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. Semantics. Mm -hmm. I think I also remember seeing something about Wisconsin having a law that you can't have sex with a virgin even on the wedding night, which just seems dumb. Yeah, there are many sex laws that are... Yeah. Sex laws in general are dumb. Yes. I mean, there's like specific like guidelines about, you know, age. Yeah. That I agree with, but like... Yes. Also, um, the whole, like, if it's your boss, like, thing. Then yeah. there, there are Power so dynamics. Many, and there shit. are so many laws. Like, literally, we could tangent about this for hours. Oh, my God, we could. We're not going to, though. No, we're not going to. Back In to fact, the show. Yeah. Cole gets back up, and Jack swings the knife at Cole, but misses. Cole says that, that must be the knife he used to kill the victim. Jack asks if he wants a closer look and tries to stab Cole. Cole grabs his wrist, saying that he has one more chance to confess and talk to the police. And he kind of, like, twists the guy's wrist until he drops the knife. And, and he starts getting this, like, look on his face. Yeah. Jack asks, or what? And then Cole changes into Balthazar and says, or, or deal, deal with, with me. me. Just then, Daryl and Leo walk outside, and Daryl <laughs> sees Balthazar and gets out his gun. It was hilarious. It was great. And then Balthazar turns to Daryl. And just kind of gets a, a sly smile on his face and go, I think he's ready to talk. Yeah. And then Daryl glances at Leo, who nods at him, and then Daryl puts his gun away. It was the funniest little moment. It was hilarious, because this is the first time Daryl has seen Balthazar. Uh-huh. Oh, and my God. And it was God. just like, uh... Fuck, demon! Uh. Yeah. It was great. Also, this is the second time he's seen this particular guy in demon makeup. Yes. Because of the, the yep. Grimlocks. Yep. So yep. that's funny. He's like, oh my god, it's that Mike guy, but wearing red and black instead of white this time. Yep. <laughs> I wonder if they bonded. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> but yeah, it's just very funny. So then we cut back to the manor. Patty is putting the bride and groom back onto the top tier of the broken cake while Victor... Comes uh, up and, like, steals a finger of frosting. While holding and, a flashlight. And she slaps his hand away. And it was so adorable. Because it was like you could tell that they probably did that at least a couple of times. And it got more playful every time. Yeah. Phoebe is lighting candles. And Leo is worried because Prue isn't back yet, even though the police had the killer. Cole, Cole says, says that, that they might have held her for escaping custody. And Victor asks if they can get some lights. Phoebe reminds them that the police cut the power line, and, and then, then Grams appears. appears. She says that she's there to take Patty back, but Patty says that there's still five minutes to midnight, which is why we know that apparently witching hour is midnight. 
For this purpose, anyway. Right. Victor laments, not saying more to convince Piper, but Patty says that he was wonderful. Prue and Daryl then walk in, apologizing for being late, and Victor shines a flashlight at them, and then Piper walks in. Piper, she takes off her yeah. sweater and asks what they're all waiting for, which I thought was hilarious. Yeah, and she looks up, she walks past Leo and says, don't look so shocked, and he smiles at her. Yeah. Graham tells them that it's showtime, everyone stands in place, and Prue helps put Piper's veil back on. Victor asks to be Leo's best man, which he says that he would be honored by. Like, then was Daryl the best man before? No, he didn't have one. Okay. He just didn't have one. Weird. No. And then Phoebe realizes that there was no power for the music. So Grams flicks her hand and makes the wind chimes play canon in D. <laughs> Prue asks about the lighting and Leo makes five clouds of bright lights appear above them. And it's really fun because they're, they're almost like sparklers. Uh-huh. And they're just, like, letting down these, like, glowy little sparkles. Spits of light. Yeah. It's spitting light on them. Yeah. It was super fun. Graham then clears her throat and begins the ceremony. Now, I know that I've mentioned hand fasting before, so I'm not going to tangent on it. Now, we're going to fast track the scene a bit. Because otherwise, otherwise it's going to make me cry. Yeah. They each say that they are there of their own free will. They face each other, join hands, and recite their vows to each other after the cord twines around their hands. Yeah. They are beautiful vows, and they literally made me tear up. I will link to a YouTube video for that scene if you just want to watch it and listen to the vows. After the vows... <sighs> oh, sorry. After the vows is when Grams ties the rope yep. around their hands to bind them to the vows. Which is done with the magic of a reverse shot of the cord being pulled off their hands. Yep. And there's a so mood it be, and then the clock strikes midnight, and, and Grace tells Leo, Leo to kiss, kiss her, her fast. fast. They both and laugh, they and then they do. And, and everyone and applauds and grins, and there's little light clouds that start sprinkling down the, the bits of yeah, light, the, like the, confetti. The lights Leo put up start going haywire, yeah. but in a nice way. And everyone looks in awe, and then we see Grams blow a kiss to everyone, and we end on Piper and Leo still kissing, and we go to the end credits. It was lovely. Mm hmm and by far one of my favorite episodes, like, ever. I figured. Yeah. You know, I was half expecting, um, like, the end credits to have, like, a either in memory or, like, celebrating something. Because mm -mm. that, that happens a lot with, like, extremely moving, meaningful episodes of TV. Like, they'll be written for the memory of someone who worked on it or, like, maybe... So, like two of the people heavily involved with it like got married or something or had a kid but no there was none of that here nope but it was i i really think that this might be my highest rated i know for a fact this is my highest rated episode so far but i think this might be my highest rated episode of the series i don't know yet since we haven't watched the rest of it mm -hmm. and i don't remember most of it yeah but something tells me this will probably be my highest rated episode at least for uh quite a while mm -hmm. So, with that, we are on to our ratings portion. Would you like to go first, or would you like me to go first? Uh, I'll go first. I think you went first last week. Sure. Uh, I'm going to give it 9.5 out of 10 toppling tears. Beautiful. And I am giving it a 9.75 out of 10 wonderful wedding. And the reason that it's only getting a 9.75 instead of a 10 out of 10... Because TJ... <sighs> Is because of TJ. Yeah. Like, I, mm, you don't like that knockoff Kaniki. I don't. I just don't. Like, I, um, and I also think part of it is also like giving it a 10 out of 10 means that it's the most perfect episode ever. And it just, it isn't. There's still, mm -hmm. there's, there's just enough little things that it, it knocks off just a little quarter of a point. Mm -hmm. But it's still by far my favorite episode. It has everything it needs to have. It has the happiness of Piper and Leo getting married. It has Victor finally accepting Leo. It has Cole not being a little shit for the most part. It just, it's very nice. Yeah. And it also gives Prue a little bit more depth. character development and depth. Mm -hmm. And I like it. I like it a lot. So, that means we are now on to our outfits. Mm -hmm. Now, as much as I loved... All of their, like, casual stuff. I can't not pick the wedding outfits because, yeah. oh my god. Yeah. 
Like, even Prue with the unfortunate flower placement, <laughs> it was still my favorite outfit on her. Like, I liked the Argyle sweater looking thing. But, like, that's so boring as compared to everything else yeah. that she's ever worn that I just really like the wedding Especially outfits. at work. Well, yeah, there is that. But yeah, I just really, really like the wedding outfits. Like, I don't mm-hmm. think there's any way that I could pick anything but those. Yeah, that's fair. And Piper's wedding Though dress. No, I did. I did love Prue's biker outfit. That yeah. was hot. I mean, it, it didn't look bad, and, and it, it looked was, really... That was hot. Yeah, like, it looked real good on her. But, I mean, the, there's just I'll, no... I'll take me some double denim Prue any day. Yeah. Oh, double denim. You that was a very so... early aughts thing. Yeah, it Except is. everyone else who did double denim in the early aughts did light wash denim, which was a mistake. Well, there is that. Anyway, so with our ratings done and our outfits done, we are on to social media. As per the usual, you can always find all of the episodes and all of the links and stuff at Mm charmchats.com. You can email us with any of your questions or comments or whatever at charmchats at gmail.com. We are on Twitter and Tumblr at charmchatspod. We are on Instagram and Facebook as Charm Chats. Uh, we have merch available for all y'all. It's over at redbubble.com slash people slash waterflame. Yep. If you have any suggestions for other stuff we could put up on merch, that would be great. We'd love to do that shit. Yeah, absolutely. If there's literally, if there's a, a phrase that you like or an image that you would like us to, to have drawn up that you want Uh, like anything let Mm -hmm. us know and we will see about making it happen yeah because it's fun right now we we have our things yeah we have our logo we have a la convenience we We have have a thing of blue yeah we have a a blue with got familiar yeah and we have our cartoon logo the cartoony version of the logo which is by far like the most adorable cartoony version of anything yeah but it's not the main logo so it's not as it is technically an official logo, yeah, but it is not the official logo. Um, the official logo uh, will technically be uh, the official logo as of season four. That's when I will be changing over. From oh, the, on iTunes. Okay. Yeah, on iTunes. Yeah. That's uh, starting season four is when I will change all of the picture stuff over to the brand new logo that we are selling as stickers and t-shirts and whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, just because I didn't, I didn't want to, like, I couldn't go back and change it from the beginning of season three, and I didn't want to change it halfway through, because that just seemed weird. Weird. So. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. And uh, if you are so inclined, we do have a Patreon. We and do. any contribution amount will get you access to all of our bonus content, all of, like, the bloopers and stuff. And our Discord server where you can chat with us whenever you like. Yep. And we, the Discord server is by far the fastest way to get at least my attention. Yeah. Um, It'll get my attention too. I have the notifications set up, but I often forget to go in. Yeah. I mean, like, I check the email uh, usually once a week. Sometimes while we're talking about social media. Yep. <laughs> it's a thing. It happens. Um, but... I am on the Discord literally every day. So I'm, I'm just there. It's just open on my computer at all times. So if you are a Patreon patron and you are not already in the Discord, let us know. Uh, just send me an email or send me a, a tweet or a Facebook message, uh, and I will make sure that you get the link to that. Um, yeah. I think that's it then. I do believe that is it. And if not... Oops. Whatever. Yeah. So until next time, sleep tight. Don't let the warlocks bite. Bye. Bye. Bee Piper and Prue, they've got evil to slay and some potions to brew. So we'll see where it's at next time with Kendra and Kat. 